So good afternoon. So first, uh, I thank Professor Anber, Professor Klein for their introductions. And uh, so uh, I enjoyed very much to be with you for this lecture. I have to, to give a good lecture to show that I, I deserve the doctorate <laughs> of the <laughs> this, after, this evening. Okay, so um, my talk is, you say, uh, you say Spintronics. Spintronics is a new field of research, new field of technology too, uh, that uh, more or less sometimes is to say that uh, Spintronics is a new type of electronics, uh, harnessing not only the charge of the electrons, but also the so small magnet of the electrons, the spin, uh, for new functionality. And so finally, you see the spin, this is a, you can see the spin wiggling on the screen. Uh, Spintronics is mainly known uh, for the giant magnetoresistance, as you, you have, uh, it had been said. From my point of view, the Spintronics, the discovery of the GMR, the giant magnetoresistance, was only one step in a much longer process. There was something before, a fundamental research on the property of the magnetic material, on the influence of the orientation of the spin on the electrical conditions. This uh, fundamental research has led, with the L, thanks also to the technology, to the discovery. There was one step, and then after this first step, the, the research was very active and uh, uh, led to other discovery, to other application, and now the field of spintronic expanded in many novel directions, a very promising novel direction, as I will try to show. Uh, for example, is certainly one of the best way for what is called the beyond CMOS, what can be done to go beyond the limits of the electronics with semiconductor of today. So now, in this uh, first uh, projections, I try to summarize what was the development of spintronics. You see at the beginning the property of the uh, influence of the electron spin on the conduction property in magnetic material, mainly to, to sum up rapidly. The conduction is not the same for the electron. The, the, the conductivity is not the same for the electron having their spin along the magnetization axis to the north pole or in the opposite direction. But this uh, spin-dependent property of the conduction in magnetic material can be exploited only in nanostructure. If you are able, if you have the tool to fabricate this nanostructure, for example, in multilayer, you see the bolts are atoms, and this multilayer is made by uh, the superposition of uh, uh, atomic layer of two or three or four um, uh, only uh, atomic distances. And the combination of the, this, uh, this fundamental physics and this nanostructure has led to the spintronic properties, the giant magnetoresistance, the GMR, the GMR, other properties, TMR is a tunneling magnetoresistance. These properties are now classical spintronic properties. They have led to several applications, not only the hard disk, uh, that you know, the, the GMR, you, you use the uh, GMR to read the hard disk of your computer or to listen to music uh, in your iPod, uh, and there are also other applications where uh, M ramps. And now, uh, Spintronics is expanded in many directions. For example, a very active field of research is the field of uh, spin transfer. In a spin transfer experiment, you can manipulate a magnetization without applying a magnetic field, as usual, but by a sort of uh, transfusion of spin by an electrical current, a sort of transport of non-volatile uh, magnetization by purely by electrical waves. Yeah? And this uh, spin transfusion, spin transfer, uh, can be used either to manipulate the magnetization, to switch the magnetization, this can be used to hide the new type of memories we call M rams or STT rams, STT ram, spin transfer torque rams that will enter your computer relatively soon, I guess. And in other conditions, this uh, spin transfer 
can be used to generate oscillation of the magnetization and finally generate uh, um, oscillation in the radio wave frequency range with certainly soon also uh, application in telecommunications. So this is spin transfer. But there are other variety fields. Spintronic with semiconductor is okay. This, this was to illustrate the MRAMs, the STT RAMs, the mem new memory cell based. This was to illustrate the um, application to telecommunication of spin transfer oscillation. Uh, Spintronic with semiconductor is also a variety field. Uh, semiconductor will be certainly the way to couple the uh, spintronics with optics. Huh? And other very promising field of research is spintronics with carbon-based material, like carbon and tube and mainly graphene. Huh? Graphene is, is very attractive you know, for spintronics. And there are also other interesting direction of research. Single electron spintronics is one of the way for quantum computing. So uh, I will not review all this novel direction of research. You can see it will be the novel view of my talk. I will begin by very, a very, very simple introduction for those who are not familiar with, with physics. I know that we have even a representative of the Danish parliament in the room. Uh, and uh, so I will speak about the physical base of spintronic very simply on the discovery of the GMR. Uh, then I will proceed, the second part will be on a spin transfer torque, the application to the STT RAMs and to the ST oscillator, the STO. And then the last part will be on uh, spin tronics with graphene. And if sometime in life I have some other, we say a few words, on some other novel direction of research. So, physical basis of uh, spin tronic is uh, that in a magnetic metal, like for example iron, or cobalt, uh, physicists know that there is a, a spin splitting of the conduction band, and this is the origin of what is called the spontaneous magnetism. There is not the same population in the majority spin band and in the minority spin band. So, so there is a magnetization because there is not the same number of spins. And uh, for the uh, conduction properties, also, the conduction will be different for the majority spin, spin up, and minority spin, spin down channel. In fact, you can uh, see the conduction by two channels, spin up and spin downs, and the contrast between like two lanes on the, on the road, and uh, the contrast between the, this can be very large sometimes, especially if uh, one dopes the metal, cobalt or iron, with some impurity, also uh, presenting a strongly spin-dependent cross-section for the electron, for the scattering of electrons. And for example, you can see below the, uh, resistive, the resistivity induced by 1% of several uh, of different types of impurity in nickel. Uh, so you put impurities this in use a, a resistivity in the two channel spin down, uh, spin up, and you can see if you put cobalt in nickel, the uh, resistance in use by the impurity is 20 times larger in the spin down channel. That means that if you put cobalt impurity, you you close this lane, and finally, and the conduction is mainly by this free channel, the spin up channel. On the contrary, if you consider uh, vanadium or chromium, this is the opposite situation. You, 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 close, you stop the current in this direction, and the current can go, there is a free channel. And uh, so this, uh, these results are not really new. There, was, there were in my PhD in 70, huh? and at this time, this can be explained by the theoretical model developed by um, Friedel and the school of Friedel in Orsay. And also at this time, during my PhD, uh, I had some experiments more or less anticipating the, the concept of the GMR. Uh, experiments in uh, alloys in which uh, I put uh, two types of impurities. Suppose, for example, we put at the same time cobalt and chromium. And then, by putting these two types of impurity at the same time, you, you slow down the electron in the two channel and the resistivity was observed to increase strongly. And on the contrary, by putting in the same uh, nickel, cobalt and iron, 
we were in this situation, this uh, spin-up channel was remaining free and, and the resistivity was remaining small. Uh, and, and this is more or less the concept of the GMR. In fact, on the GMR, uh, the, um, we, put on the, we put on the way of the electron two magnetic layer, and the situation where the magnetization are in opposite directions correspond to the situation of cobalt and cobalt. That means that one of the layers stops the electrons in one of the channels, and the second layer stops the electron in the second channel, and the resistivity should be high. And on the contrary, by applying a small magnetic field, it can be very small, you can align the magnetization in the same direction, and you are now in the situation of cobalt and iron, that is, one of the channels is free. This is the concept of the GMR. But, but if one knows the uh, equation for the electrical conditions, it's easy to see that this concept can work if the distance between the two layers is uh, smaller than what is called the mean free pass, electron mean free pass, which in metallic film is something like a few nanometers. So at this time, in 70, it was not possible to imagine be able to fabricate a thin layer uh, with only one or two or three nanometers. So for me, I put this uh, ideas uh, on the eyes, but then technology, the beginning of the nanotechnology in the 80s, it became possible, due to the developments of microelectronics, to, to fabricate this very thin layer. Uh, for example, with this sort of uh, big machine, with this uh, MBA machine, molecular mini-pitaxi. And at this time, uh, it was I cool with the collaboration with experts of the MBA, uh, to fabricate this sort of multi-layer, that is, for example, Triatomic layer of iron, triatomic layer of chromium, etc. Why? Why iron and chromium? Because my Nobel laureate Peter Grunberg in 86 has found that with very thin layer of chromium, three atoms, you see, uh, there was some interaction between the adjacent magnetic layer, uh, putting the magnetization in opposite direction. So. From these results, it turned out that it was the ideal case to, to test my ideas on the uh, GMR, my concept of the GMR. Uh, and uh, so, my plan uh, to do, because the magnetic field it was able to, to align the magnetization, and this led to the discovery of the GMR by the team of Peter Gunberg in, Orsay, in uh, Germany and uh, by my team in Orsay. You can see one of the first results is the resistance as a function of the magnetic field. And when the magnetic fields align the magnetization, uh, with this, uh, you can see the GMR is uh, this huge drop, 80% of the resistivity. Um, this is the GMR, what we call GMR. Uh, okay, the, the layer, the current was parallel to the layer, not exactly the concept that I have described, but it's more or less the same, because the electrons are not only uh, with the velocity uh, along the current direction. And what you can see is that this occurs, uh, the maximum effect is occurring for a thickness of chromium less than one nanometer. And this is the, the, this sort of experiments was really needing uh, the potential to fabricate very, very thin layer. And so the, so the, the discovery came from this meeting between fundamental ideas and the uh, advances of the technologies. Uh, so the, the, the interpretation is, of course, what you can expect, that is, when the magnetization of all the layers are parallel, for one of the spin direction, the electron can go easily uh, uh, through all the magnetic layer and the resistance is low. Of course, this is a too simple description, of course. Huh? You have also to take into account, but I will not describe the uh, accurate theory, taking into account the reflection of the interface, the roughness of the interface. But more or less, the, the concept is, is very simple. And I will say simply a few words on the applications. The well-known application is the application to the heat edge of the hard disk. On the hard disk, uh, the information is stored on a circle, these tracks, these magnetic tracks, 
with uh, magnetic bits, uh, with the magnetization pointing to the left and to the right, 0 and 1. And uh, the reading this information is simply detecting this uh, small magnetic field generated by these magnetic bits. And uh, so uh, in your hard, hard disk drive, you have a read heads uh, with a, a multilayer. And when this multilayer sees this field, it raises a field uh, aligned the magnetization and the resistivity drops, and this opens the, uh, the way to the current, and you can detect the magnetization, and, and the, the, the magnetic bit. And with the sensitivity of the GMR, it has been possible to detect smaller fields, and so detect uh, smaller bits, and so to put a larger number of bits in the same area. And so this has led to an increase of the capacity of the disk by from, from before to, to now, to about three order of magnitude. Uh, so this is uh, so this is a best known uh, application of the GMR, the, and also this uh, what can be said is that at the beginning we were thinking that it will be applied only to the hard disk of the computer, but finally when people realized that it was possible to put a lot of memory, a lot of capacity of information in small, uh, a small area like the area of a coin, this opened the way to, uh, to the hard disk for the mobile electronics cameras iPods, uh, some telephones too. And, and, and then when this technology, once this technology has been developed for, for the, this type of application, now I see that it's applied to other applications. Recently, I was in Stanford and one of my colleagues in Stanford, Professor Wang, uh, gave me these uh, slides that I will show. He's developing a, a, a magnetic sensor for uh, biological analysis, uh, suppose that in a um, drop of blood, you want to analyze some type of um, biomolecule, some type of proteins, for example, an antigens characteristic of some disease. Uh, uh, so the sensor of Professor Wang is composed, there are similar development also in Europe, is composed of a GMR sensor here, uh, on which there is uh, the antibody uh, corresponding to the antigens you want to, to detect. And uh, in the um, drop of blood also, there are, uh, and so this uh, antibody attracts the, the antigens, but also in the blood you can put some other antibodies uh, decorated by magnetic particle, and then this magnetic particle generate a magnetic field that is detected by this GMR sensor. And, Professor Wang says that with the sensitive GMR is able to uh, detect very, very small concentration of uh, molecules, and so what he say enabling earlier cancer detection. Uh, and uh, this is a picture of uh, one of the prototype of this uh, analyzer, uh, in which uh, small size prototype with includes not only a sensor for a given molecule, but something like more than 100 uh, different sensors. These sensors are very small, a few microns, and so you can put many of them. And there are in this uh, prototype here, you, have, you can analyze successively uh, the concentration of uh, 100 times of different proteins. Okay, so this was to, as, uh, this is the first part of my talk. As you can see, this discovery of the GMA huh, came from this meeting between technology and uh, fundamental science, and, uh, and then uh, the application continued to be developed. And now I will um, um, proceed to this uh, second part of the talk on the spin transfer effect. In fact, I will begin by some, a few words on the TMR of the magnetic tunnel junctions because they are involved in the experiments I will describe. What is a magnetic tunnel junction is again a multilayer, but now the central layer is insulating, for example, this magnesium oxide. Uh, and so that the transport, the electrical transport from between the two layers is uh, uh, low, but a, a quantum mechanical effect, which is called tunneling. In fact, in quantum mechanics, the, um, 
an electron is not localized on a single point, but uh, there is a wave function ex expanding a little more, and uh, if this thickness is very small, say a few atomic layer, uh, the wave function expands a little on the other side, and this, this is the origin of what is called the tunneling. And uh, so, but the final effect is the same. The resistance of the tunnel junctions is, is different for the parallel and anti-parallel configuration of the magnetization in the two electrodes. This is a typical example of experimental results uh, uh, in a um, tunnel in which the reversal field of the two layers is not the same. So by sweeping the field, the magnetization are parallel in the negative direction. Then one of the magnetization switches the two magnetization are anti-parallel. You see a large effects. One goes from one to three point five, and then just and then at the end, when the second layer is able to be reversed, the one uh, return to the initial level. So this is uh, uh, typically a, a TMR, uh, which is used either to um, obtain a in effect like the GMR, but also very generally to prepare spin polarized current. The current crossing the layer can be polarized with this type of uh, junction to say 80, 90 percent. That is, uh, the current is mainly carried by one of the spin direction. Uh, and, and, and so there is, okay, you can say uh, this has been possible due to the technological advance, the preparation of this very thin layer. But uh, in fact, there is a, a lot of physics too. Eh? We'll, so a few words for the physicists now to, 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 to show that uh, the, this very high performance uh, magnetic junctions come also from advance in the understanding of the tuning process. In fact, uh, in, uh, if, uh, in, a, in fact, in the, these uh, junctions are single crystal periodic lattice. And a periodic lattice, you know that the wave function can be classified according to their symmetry. For example, in this MGO, there are wave functions, the evanescent waves carrying the current in the uh, insulating layer. They are called uh, evanescent because their intensity decreases progressively, uh, are of different symmetry, delta 1, delta 5, delta 2. And you can see that one is very interesting for the tunneling. This is delta one because it decreases much less than the other. And, and uh, in fact, this different symmetry also exists in the wave function of the co cobalt electrodes. And uh, uh, the key point is that uh, uh, so uh, the symmetry delta one exists only in the spin-up band, majority spin of cobalt, and not in the spin on And also, if the interface are of high quality, that is uh, matching well the two crystal lattices, there is at the interface conservation of the spin direction and conservation of the symmetry of the wave functions. So suppose first the parallel configuration of the magnetization, that means that on this side, there are uh, states delta one with the same spin orientation, so the the, the, the tunnel can uh, tunneling can be um, uh, obtained by uh, tunneling by this channel, conserving the spin direction and conserving the symmetry because the symmetry delta one corresponds to the same spin orientation between the magnetization are parallel. So the resistivity is very low. And the, why the uh, performance is very high? Because in the anti-parallel configuration, even if you, uh, this uh, spin-up electron with symmetry electron can go, go on the other way, but then, because now this spin direction becomes mi minority spin direction on this side, there is no state of symmetry delta one to accommodate it. And this channel cannot be used, only the other, and the resistivity becomes much higher than in this configuration. It was simply to, to explain that, in fact, the advance came not only from the possibility of making this 
very beautiful tunnel junction epitaxial single crystal, but also for this better understanding of the role of the symmetry of the wave function in tunneling. And so finally, uh, for example, this can be used. And so in this, uh, this was okay. And this, uh, this is known, for example, with MGO. One selects the symmetry of the one with other type of uh, barriers, tunnel barrier, it's possible to uh, select other symmetry to reverse uh, polarization. So now, after this, a few words, uh, maybe a little too technical for those who are not physicists in the room, uh, I will proceed to the spin transfer phenomena. Uh, no, the application first, uh, some, uh, a few words on the applications. So these uh, tunnel junctions will be the basis of a new type of uh, memory, which is called MRAM. You know that on your computer, uh, you have a, a massive memory in the disk, huh? uh, but the disadvantage of the disk is that the access time is relatively long, one millisecond to get a bit. Huh? Too, too, too long for the speed of the computer today. And so when you switch on your computer, you store a part of the memory in the RAMs, in the random access memory of the disk, semiconductor memories uh, that have a very fast access time, a few nanoseconds, uh, but they are volatile. They are volatile, that means that you need some electrical power to maintain the memory alive. And so this is, this is, so you know that you have to save what you work again on the disk, if not because the memory is not able uh, to, um, to, to keep the memory after switching off the computer. And also this is one of the important sources of energy consumption, because you need electrical power even if the computer does not work. Even between two clicks, you have to still to, to, to put some uh, so, some energy. And so the idea of the uh, MRAMs uh, is to, to replace uh, the memory cells uh, of the classical RAMs by these tunnel junctions with two states. Uh, and uh, this is uh, the first generation uh, uh, with the idea of having now non-volatility. That is non-volatile memory, uh, not consuming energy, less consuming energy. Uh, what is called in technical terms normally of electronics. And so the first generation has been put into the market by Motorola uh, and some other company uh, maybe six years ago. Uh, and uh, uh, I've not, the, the impact has been, so the, the, the density is not so large, the capacity is not so large with this first generation where the switching, the writing of the memory is obtained externally by magnetic field generated by these lines, by pulse of current in this line. But there are some applications, for example, they are also big advantage for uh, avionics, for space, because they are not sensitive to the uh, radiation of the atmosphere, and so there are, you can find a, a very general use of this memory in, in the Airbus plane, for example, but a bigger impact for really for our computer is expected from the new generation will be STT RAM, spin transfer technology. And so now I proceed to the uh, physics of spin transfer. So we'll explain the physics of spin transfer. Is, uh, uh, is uh, okay. Physics suppose that uh, you prepare a spin polarized current by, with a first layer. Suppose that the polarization, the spin polarization of the current, is obliquely oriented with respect to the magnetization of the second layer. So this electron will uh, go through the uh, second layer, and inside the layer, what is called the exchange attraction, will align very rapidly the spin polarization of the current along the magnetization axis. Uh, and uh, uh, so the, these electrons have lost the transverse component of the spin polarization, the transverse spin polarization. But the uh, exchange interaction is spin conserving, conserve the uh, rotation motion, conserve the spin. 
And, and so what had been lost by the uh, electrons, this transverse component, has been simply given, that means, has been give, simply given to the total spin of this layer, which means a rotation or a torque acting on the magnetization. Spin transfer, so transfer of spin to rotate the magnetization. This is a principle, it's more or less like uh, we, when you play balls, you throw a ball, and after the collision, this ball stops and another ball uh, takes the, its velocity. This is the conservation of the uh, linear momentum. In this case, is uh, conservation of the uh, rotation momentum, the spin. And, and, and so uh, these uh, experiments of uh, spin transfer are generally done in this sort of nanostructure called uh, pillars. Uh, so you see very small diameters, again, thanks to the development of the technology that now make possible to, to fabricate this complex structure. There is a polarizer to prepare the currents that, after crossing, for example, a tunnel junction or a copper layer, will manipulate the uh, magnetization of the second layer, back and forth, for example. Uh, and this is an experimental example. Uh, after some threshold currents, the, uh, this increase of the resistance corresponds to the switching between parallel to anti-parallel and back by reversing the current. So a way to manipulate electronically the magnetization, a sort of transport to distance uh, from this layer to this layer of uh, magnetization. Uh, and uh, this is uh, what is applied in the uh, new type of uh, MRAM called STT RAMs are developed by many companies today. The, the products will appear in one or two years uh, into the market. And uh, this is again a sort of, um, this is a, the scheme of the uh, memory cells. Huh? Uh, two states of memory correspond to parallel and parallel configuration, but with, uh, uh, local, uh, with a very local addressing, switching, writing the memory by simply a spin transfer, uh, with, according to the announcement by many companies, uh, a, a very interesting advantage in terms of reduction of energy consumption. So this type of memory will certainly appear soon, Okay, it will replace progressively the RAMs of the computer with mainly advantage in terms of energy consumption. You know that uh, in terms of energy consumption, uh, I know some number of friends, for example, the, the percentage of uh, electrical energy um, consumed by the server and the computer is something like 7% of the total energy consumption. And people of the industry of computers think that uh, this uh, introduction of STT RAM with some other uh, advance in the hard disk also will reduce by a factor of two the energy of the computer. It's not negligible even in terms of global energy consumption in the world. And also uh, there are already some uh, more advanced projects of introducing the STT RAM in the logic circuits of the computer. Uh, there is even a book on that. In fact, according to the more recent projects, uh, there are in, in now in some processor, in some processor, which is called the FPG processor, processor, you have uh, uh, with semiconductor a CMOS, semiconductor logic circuit, and uh, uh, side by side a CMOS memory made with flash memory and uh, RAM memory. And now, in the development of several companies, uh, the, the CMOS memory is replaced by a STT RAM with some emb all embedded directly on the logic circuits. With, uh, according to the, to the announcement of many companies, several advantages in terms of size, reduction of the size, but also in terms of energy consumption. So this will be also uh, the new, the next impact or spintronics in the computer technology. More generally, what I can say is that, uh, in fact, uh, in the, you know, one of the concerns of the electronic industry is what can be done to push the limit of semiconductor. You know, you know that uh, so far, uh, the, um, there was uh, more slow that uh, there 
is a, a continuous decrease of the size of the components and increase of the speed. And one knows that there will be some physical limits with a semiconductor, with the CMOS technology. Uh, this limit will be reached after, say, 10 years now. And this is one of the concerns of this industry. And, and, and as I call beyond CMOS, what can be done after to, 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 to increase again the performance of, of the electronics? And, and in between, there will be certainly a, a generation of hybrid structure pushing a little more the limits of the CMOS technology. And certainly this sort of processor is already one of the first examples of this hybrid structure in, in between CMOS and the beyond CMOS and reality beyond CMOS. There will be uh, a coexistence of this different technology in a, some hybrid uh, devices. Okay, so, so he was to explain one of the applications of uh, spin transfer of this. Uh, and the second application is to telecommunications. In fact, in some other conditions, if uh, in this sort of pillars again, uh, if, uh, for example, by applying a field, but in other condition too, uh, if you prevent the uh, re complete reversal of the magnetization of the free layer, uh, the uh, magnetization is set into a state of steady precession, like that. And during these precessions of the magnetization of one of the layers, of course, there is a, a periodic variation of the angle between the two magnetization. And so, because the resistance of this uh, tra-layer of tunnel junctions depends on the angle on parallel or anti-parallel, there is a periodic variation of the resistance of the uh, structure that is uh, of the res And so, a periodic variation, there is a, a, a DC current generating these oscillations. And, and then a periodic variation of the voltage between the top and the bottom. And so, in other words, emission of a, a microwave power, a power uh, an oscillation in the microwave frequency range, the gigahertz range. Uh, this is for it. with the DC currents. There is also some application with the DC currents, uh, generation of uh, a DC voltage when you apply a EC currents in the uh, intrinsic frequency range with uh, several type of application come uh, reference uh, um, radio frequency wave source in uh, reception emission chain in telecommunication integration into uh, phase loop um, phase locking loops and uh, very promising application in several field telecommunication memory uh, i don't know the time to describe all the technical aspect of this advantage of the STOs, spin transfer oscillators. But I can say that one of the main advantage is the tunability and the agility. So the, uh, depending on the current intensity generating the oscillation, the frequency can be moved uh, rapidly and in a broad range, in a broader range than on the oscillator of today that uh, connected to the oscillation of a crystal, for example. And so this uh, will be for the telecommunication of the next year, of the next decade, if you want to, to be able to, uh, to, to tune to different type of frequency, it would be a, a big advantage. So there is a lot of uh, developments. The small size also is interesting for on-chip integration. And uh, in the, but this field has uh, uh, advanced very rapidly. In fact, the, the key issue a few years ago was increasing the power to be able to uh, for for applications and also improving the spectral purity. That is decreasing the width of the emission huh? and uh, also synchronizing a large number of STO was also a challenge to increase the power as the square of the number and decrease. But the advance had been very fast, and we are now in this field. Uh, research is close to, to, to apply device. Eh? Uh, to increase the power, uh, the increase of the power has been made possible by using these very high performance tunnel junctions, single crystal tunnel junction with the MGO barrier. 
with this sort of tunnel junction, the resistance is large, the magneto resistance is large, so during the oscillation there is a large signal, AC voltage between the bottom and the top of the layers. This is the type of structure we are working on in collaboration with a, a group at Tsukuba. Uh, so this, uh, this type of uh, device uh, allows to obtain power in the microwatt range, which is good for this uh, nanometric device uh, and sufficient for many applications, but, but there was an obstacle. In fact, the line width remains always too, too, uh, too, too broad, too large uh, for most applications because these oscillations, there is a lot of modes with more or less the same frequency. So multiple of the modes give up. And so it was necessary to find other types of magnetic excitation with more isolated modes of excitations. And finally, uh, a good, uh, uh, good result can be obtained with another type of magnetic excitations in this type of tunnel junctions, also work in collaboration with the Japanese group, uh, is possible in, in the free layer. This is the MGO, this is a reference layer uh, to, to prepare the current. This is the, the, the free layer. It's possible to stabilize a, what is called a vortex configuration of the magnetization. That is a circular with, uh, uh, in the center, the um, the magnetization up or down, as this is the polarity, up or down. And uh, what occurs when uh, one excites by spin transfer, by a current, by a spin polarized current, this sort of structure, this is excitation, a, what is a rotation of the center of the vortex. Huh? And um, this is simulation. And during these rotations, of course, depending on the position of the vortex on, the, on this side, this side, you can see that in the major part of the dot, huh, uh, the uh, magnetization is up or down. That is, that with the rotation, there is a periodic variation of the magnetization in this layer and due to this rotation. And again, because this uh, magnetization is fixed, there is a periodic variation of the resistance of the tunnel junctions and so emission of a signal in the microwave frequency range, and you can see, depending of course on the currents, you, you, you can increase the current to change the frequency, but then in these first experiments, something better can be done with a line width which is relatively small, one megahertz for generation of frequency in the gigahertz range. Uh, physics, there is a lot of physics, I don't have the time to, to focus on the physics you, uh, uh, it would be interesting, but in fact, this is an uh, interesting physics of this excitation of vortices. Uh, in fact, when a, a, vortex, a vortex is uh, shifted from its equilibrium position, the center of the dot, uh, it's well known that it comes back to this equilibrium position by spiraling in the, of this type, clockwise or anticlockwise, depending on the polarity. And so finally, the physics, the basis of physics is to, to be able to uh, balance the damping force that makes this uh, spiraling, uh, to, to stabilize on a circle like that, uh, to uh, come balance the damping force by this component of the spin transfer force. The, the, the damping force depends on the corpolarity because the rotation depends, sense direction depends on the polarity, the, this component depends on the direction of the current, depends on the direction of the spin polarization, of the outer plane spin polarization of the current. And so there are several rules that now are known uh, for the positive currents means uh, polarity and spin polarization in the same direction of up down, etc. So this physics now is well understand, uh, understood and uh, uh, some quantitative law, but I know the time to, to get uh, to give more details on the, this physics. For the application, uh, one, it was necessary to, to go a little farther. So because it was not very easy for a, a practical device to apply a, a vertical field 
to generate a auto plane polarization. Uh, you, it's not very convenient to have an electron magnet in your phone, in your mobile phone. Huh? Uh, and so now we uh, we are uh, we we have developed other type of devices. For example, this type of device decoupling the excitation of the vortex from the detection. So the, the excitation of the vortex uh, is by is out of plane polarized a spin current generated by a perpendicular polarizer, a, a multilayer, and, and the horizontal. Uh, motion of the vortex is detected by a tunnel barrier, by a tunnel junctions with a in-plane uh, magnetized uh, reference layer. And so with this sort of is possible to uh, generate at zero field and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and to obtain at zero field also good signal, micro, watt, range with very small widths, small widths. Uh, less than one uh, at uh, 100 kilohertz. So you see this uh, is surprising, in fact, for me it's amazing to see how this uh, field has uh, advanced rapidly and is closed now to applications. Uh, in fact, there are even more spectacular results, for example, in this type of structure, little more complex structure, now a pillars uh, will is possible to stabilize, I don't describe why, how, uh, vortices in the two uh, layers and to generate uh, a couple of motions of the two vortices. Huh? And then uh, what, uh, is, it will be too long to explain why, this uh, couple of motion like a synchronizations allows to, to decrease strongly the, the width. There is a, a couple motion uh, that is a very isolated mode of uh, rotation, gives uh, now a line width in the kilohertz range for oscillation close to one gigahertz, so it's very interesting for application. In fact, uh, this is, uh, you can see what uh, in this range of currents you have a relatively broad lines and when the two vortex are excited, uh, the second vortex is also excited, you can see how the, uh, the narrow becomes the lines and the intensity increase. So there is certainly very uh, interesting device for the next application in telecommunication. Uh, and uh, in fact, uh, uh, Again, the technology now, the technology allowed also to prepare this sort of uh, device with uh, now excitation of two vortices, but detection of the uh, uh, generation of the vortex by a high performance tunnel junction to increase the power and even synchronizing. We have also some result on this arrays of STO, uh, example with two, and uh, we, uh, it's possible to synchronize the vortex rotation in this four layer, not only in the in one pillar but the two pillar, and also synchronization increase uh, uh, makes the uh, two. You can see the two lines, and when they can be synchronized, the both synchrons, the two lines merge into a narrow line, very narrow line of very high intensity. So you see. The, the, to see, uh, it was a spin transfer is an example where, uh, in fact, the, the advance had been very fast uh, towards the next application in telecommunications. And so I proceed in something with uh, much, uh, with uh, certainly application at much longer terms, carbon nanotube and graphene. You know that graphene is. Uh, promising material, the, the Nobel Prize has been awarded to gain a novel for their work on uh, graphene. And so I will explain now what can be done uh, with graphene. Why graphene for long-term application is also very promising in spintronics. Uh, I don't know if I have much time, uh, maybe uh, 10 minutes still. Mm. Uh, so um, why? In fact, now, you will see that uh, in this field, it's not a short-term application like those I have described for spin transfer oscillators. Huh? Uh, 
Uh, now, what I will consider is application in the beyond CMOS perspective. If you look, for example, in the roadmap of the electronic industry, it's called the ITRS roadmap, uh, and uh, there is uh, several, okay, there is a lot of things to, uh, to prepare this uh, beyond CMOS stage. Uh, and uh, there is, for example, if you look to the section which is called uh, non-charge based beyond CMOS device, uh, uh, you can see that uh, four of the six technology uh, highlighted for this beyond CMOS are spintronic device. Uh, and what is said also in the, this uh, roadmap of the electronic industry is that graphene exhibits spin transport characteristics that surpass that of any other semiconductor studied to date. And so you can see, you, you see to see that this is an important challenge. Alors why I want to be I want to, to, to be a little more concrete. What are these uh, for example all spin logic circuits? Huh? In fact this is what can be described rapidly on this sort. A, a spin only processing unit is what? Is a, un, uh, a sort of uh, logic unit, logic circuit in which uh, there is no charge current but a pure spin current. I will explain what is a pure spin current, zero charge currents, processed by a series of gates acting only on the spin. So I want, I want to define what is a pure spin current and how it can be interesting for this type of logic circuits. Uh, what is a pure spin current? In fact, in many experiments of spin tonics today, uh, this is possible to uh, generate this pure spin current. Suppose that in a lateral channel, it can be graphene, it can be a carbon nanotube, you inject a spin polarized current like that, and going to the left. That means that uh, one create in this way what, uh, because injecting more spin up than spin down, one creates what is called a spin accumulation. So can be described by a, a spin up pressure and a spin down depression. And so the spin up pressure uh, diffuses a spin up current on to the right, and the spin down depression attracts spin down electron in the opposite direction. And you have created this way what is called a pure spin current which is interesting, why? Because first, there is no capacitance effects, because it is certainly, uh, it can be easy to be convinced that uh, flipping the spin, enabling the spin current is easier than manipulating the charge currents. And several concepts uh, begin to appear on uh, logic circuits uh, in which the information is coded by the direction of polarization of pure spin currents and transport by spin, pure spin current with processing of the spin current by logic gate acting on the spin. The sort of circuit I have already shown in the preceding slide. So there is a lot of uh, projects that have been uh, appear now uh, for this um, beyond CMOS logic uh, technology. Uh, so the, the, uh, for, this is a classical uh, spin transistor proposed long time ago, but now the new system are, for example, the new device that have been proposed recently is this universal logic gates with these graphene versions, recent graphene versions. This, for example, this all spin logic uh, circuits proposed recently. There are also some projects of uh, quantum computer with uh, spin current in graphene, uh, and this is a general, uh, general scheme I have already shown. So in all this uh, device of the beyond CMOS uh, stage, uh, what one needs is a, a material in which you can propagate spin currents without relaxation to long distances. Uh, if you want to, to put several gates you need to be able to propagate this background to long distance. And what I will show that the best material appears to be graphene and carbon nanotube, mainly graphene, which is more convenient for the technology. 
In fact, uh, okay, excuse me. Okay, I show some results obtained on pure spin currents with metals and semiconductors. So this is a type of structure that are used to study the propagation of pure spin currents. This is a more different structure. This one is the simplest one, uh, simply the source the drain and uh, the signal, the spin signal is the difference uh, between the uh, voltage for the two magnetic configuration. And uh, one needs in all the application a large spin signal, large delta V or delta A, divided by E, and a long spin division lines be able to transport one. With metal, you can see the delta V are always in the microvolt range, small. Spin division lens is uh, always smaller than one micron meter. Micron, okay. So the metals, the spin relaxation is too fast for propagation to long distance. The, the, there is depolarization of the spin current at a distance less than one micron. Semiconductors, some good results have been recently obtained with silicon. Uh, uh, but still, you can see the delta V are still in the microvolt range. It's not very convenient for application. And, and at least at room temperature, the, uh, you can see that the spin division length in silicon is only 0.4 uh, micron. It's, it's, it can be 2 micron at very low temperature. So comparing now with carbon nanotube and graphene, carbon nanotube, these experiments, we are uh, of a collaboration between uh, my group and uh, a group in uh, Cambridge with a carbon nanotube between uh, these uh, magnetic electrodes, LSMO, this compound, with tunnel barrier in between, a tunnel. And you can see that immediately you see that the advantage of this carbon based material on silicon, on metals, now the voltage, the signals are, can be as large as 60 millivolt correspond to variation up to 7%, uh, even 72%, uh, uh, and uh, uh, even for relatively long uh, carbon nanotubes. And this is a, a view of the, the structure, the carbon nanotube between the two electrodes. Uh, so rapidly, without uh, difficulty, the signal are much larger. Uh, so we'll see the analysis. In fact, so it appears that the spin versions in carbon nanotubes are large, longer than 20 microns. Huh? It's better than metals and semiconductors. Uh, graphene. A lot of work has been done with graphene. Of course, why a, a long uh, spin relaxation time, a long spin division length is obtained for these carbon materials? because the uh, spin recoupling, which is at the origin of the relaxation, is, uh, is small, because there is no nuclear spin in the uh, main isotope. Uh, but uh, uh, at the beginning, the results have been a little disappointing with graphene. But they begin to be, there are some difficulty in preparing this device with graphene. But uh, now the result becomes to, to be better, and for example, uh, Van Vis announced play, uh, spin division of six micron, and we see, I will show some results in our sample where even much longer spin division lengths with graphene. In fact, this is uh, the structure we are working on. Uh, so, a graphene between uh, two magnetic electrodes uh, with a tunnel barrier in between. Uh, this is another view of the system, and as you can see, uh, okay, you can see 10% of magnetoism is not as large as for carbon nanotubes, uh, but it's still relatively large. It works at, uh, for several signals, even at room temperature, and so by comparing with carbon nanotube, we can say, okay, graphene is not as good as a carbon nanotube for transport of spin form or spin currents. Uh, no, no, finally no, because the physics is a little more complex. In fact, graphene is better than carbon nanotube. Why? In fact, why? I, I, excuse me, but um, I will be a little more 
a little technical now, uh, it's more for physicists. What is the physics uh, involved in this type of structure? Uh, in fact, the, the tunnel barrier is very important. Why? Because when you have this sort of structure with a very long spinal excursion time in graphene and a much faster spinal excursion in cobalt, in fact, you must avoid what is called spin escape, that is the diffusion of the spin accumulation in graphene, of the spin pressure in graphene into the cobalt, in which the spin can relax much more rapidly. So you need some uh, tunnel barrier to prevent this uh, spin escape, what is called to prevent the backflow of uh, spin accumulation for relaxation into the electrodes. And, but if, uh, and so you need a tunnel barrier, but if the tunnel barrier is too resistive, then the, the, the dwell time, the time spent by the electron become too long because the probability of escaping is uh, too long. And then uh, the dwell time becomes longer the spin light time and the uh, performance drops again to zero. So you need to tune the, the resistance of this interface very accurately. And in fact, the analysis that we present show that in fact the resistance of alumina here is too large and that in fact the uh, property of carbon and are better than the property of uh, uh, graphene are better than the property of nanotech. So I will be, um, I will skip a little the uh, theoretical uh, interpretation. Theoretical interpretation is uh, this, uh, what is called drift diffusion equation, describing the spin accumulation here in this sort of structure. There are several types of structure. This is a usual scheme of the uh, Fermi energy, the spin accumulation, the splitting between the two Fermi energy here, yeah, which is called spin accumulation. The signal is always related to the spin accumulation. And this spin accumulation or is described by this or, or, or the, the electrochemical potential. It is described as this classical expression. So I will not describe the physics of these equations. Uh, simply I say that uh, there is what is important parameter is the interface resistance, which is spin dependent. And uh, I show simply, I will show the results obtained by one of these structures, this one, which corresponds to the experiments on carbon and graphene. And uh, the relative magnetic resistance, the spin signal is given by this expression. Gamma is the spin asymmetry of the injection. Lambda is the spin division length in the channel of graphene. And there is, uh, uh, this is an interface resistance, the tunnel resistance controlling the spin escape. And this is, uh, so the spin escape is inversely proportional to RT. And the spin relaxation in the channel is inversely proportional to what is called the spin resistance, the product of the resistivity by the spin division length. So in fact, this, uh, ratio control the proportion of spin relaxation in the channel and by escaping into the electrodes. And I simply describe the results. One needs an interface resistance. This is a spin signal. So one needs a given value of the interface resistance here to, to have a, a signal. Then at the beginning, the signal, there is a signal increase at the, the increase of the interface resistance reduce the spin escape. Yeah? And then uh, when the spin escape is completely prevented, there is saturation and now the relaxation is in the channel. This corresponds to different regime. First, the spin signal increase as the interface resistance. This corresponds to a more or less constant relative variation, the top of this curve here for the relative variation. And then there is this saturation, and because with the interface resistance, the total resistance is going on increasing, uh, then the relative variation drops to zero, inversely proportional to the interface resistance. And so this is more or less what is observed in the experiments I have shown. The, the, the results for the carbon correspond to this range. Delta increasing as the interface resistance and delta over more or less constant. 
this is going to receive for very different interface resistance, internal resistance, always more or less the same delta over R. Right? This is this regime. And on the contrary, for graphene, the resistance at the interface are too large. We are in this regime here, corresponding to this drop as one over the internal resistance of the relative variations. And uh, this, okay, so there is a clear identification of the several regimes and, uh, of course, uh, best conditions are with the condition for the carbon nanotubes and, unfortunately, at the moment, the tunnel resistance with graphene are too large. We are in this regime where the relative variation drops. Analysis, this can be analysis with this uh, uh, theoretical expression for, I simply summarize the results for graphene, for uh, carbon nanotubes, one obtains that uh, putting here the maximum value of gamma, 0.9, observed in the experiments, that is to, to give the lower bound for the spin relaxation time and the spin division length, one obtain a spin division length larger than 25 micro. This is typical that is the results 25 micro is, is large, is long, longer than in metal and semiconductor. And for uh, same game for graphene, we are in the range, in this range, huh? corresponding to these experimental results, dropping as uh, inversely proportion to the product length multiplied by interface resistance. And again, supposing the maximum value of gamma found in experiments, we can obtain a lower bound by the spin of the lens. You can see that in graphene, Surprisingly, the, the spin of violence appears turn out to, to be very low. So it's a good surprise that the, the spin of violence in graphene is really very long and interesting for the, the type of device that I have described. Okay, so this is not surprising. Okay, the advantage of this carbon material very generally is small spin of coupling of carbon, so long spin relaxation time. And as you know, in carbon nanotubing graphene, large velocity, and both gives a combination of two propagates that gives very long spin division lengths and very promising results for uh, this device I have described at the beginning. Of course, this is only the beginning of the road to these long, long-term applications. Uh, so the, now the uh, I suppose that the spin version can be even improved, and now the next uh, challenge is to this spin gaze. But the advantage of graphene for that is, is very uh, interesting. In fact, the for electronic property of graphene are very sensitive to any adjacent layer. The proximity with the magnetic material, with the ferroelectric material, so there are several means that can be used to manipulate the spin of this graphene due to this uh, sensibility of the electronic objective to, to, to... Okay, so I will... Uh, this is more or less the end of my talk. Huh? And, uh, okay, I, I, I say a few words on the new direction of research. We have several new directions of research in your lab. Uh, and one of the interesting directions that mainly carried on by uh, a young uh, researcher of my group, this is Julie Grolier, is uh, neuromorphic, what is called now neuromorphic electronics. In fact, if you compare, uh, what, two minutes uh, now, if one compare the operation in the brain and in the, our computers today, uh, there is strong difference, of course, uh, uh, in, the, uh, in the brain the signal uh, is analog uh, and uh, is much more in, in parallel that there is many neurons in parallel than in the computer, that in most computers. And, but the main difference is uh, uh, what is called the synapse plati synaptic plasticity. Okay. In, in the brain, you know that the transmission between the neurons is made by the synapse and the transmission by the synapse change as a function of the information 
uh, that has been transmitted. This is, and so the, nerve, the synapse become more or less transmitting. And of course, this does not occur. A transistor remains a transistor with the same characteristic. But now, uh, people of um, savoir begin to think that much more can be done if some plasticity can be introduced into the components of the computers. And the first uh, uh, attempts in this way has been done at um, Hewlett Packard with uh, what they call membrane synapse. So a sort of tunnel junctions with the migration of some vacancy that makes that the uh, transmission evolves in one sense or in another direction as a function of the number of bits it transmits. Eh? So you have several pulses. And, and so we are working in several directions. One is uh, with a spin memory uh, uh, project. The other is that I will describe in a few words is based on ferroelectric materials in collaboration with the group of Agnès Barthélemy in uh, our lab. And uh, in fact, uh, what has been found is uh, that, in fact, we, we started with the magnetic tunnel junction, but then with the expertise we got uh, for the fabrication of these tunnel junctions, we proceed to tunnel junction with ferroelectric barriers. And one of the interesting results is that the uh, tunnel resistance of this tunnel junction depends strongly on the orientation of the ferroelectric polarization. You can see, for example, uh, with pulse of plus or minus 4 volt to switch up or down the ferroelectric polarization, you see you, you can, it's possible to shift the resistance by two order of magnitude. So large, what you call electro-resistance effect. This can be interesting for some new type of memories with non-resistive reading. There are already ferroelectric memory. And for the main resistive applications, uh, the idea is to work not with uh, this uh, large uh, voltage to shift completely between up and down the ferroelectric polarization, but with uh, smaller voltage to shift progressively at each uh, steps the, uh, the resistance of the, these uh, tunnel junctions, as you can see. In fact, this corresponds to uh, progressively changing the uh, polarization of the ferroelectric barrier by increasing progressively the black domains from white to, to black. And during this variation, of course, you decrease progressively. This is, for example, as a function of the number of pulses this, is, this uh, cumulative pulse time corresponds to uh, 300 pulses. You can, at each step, progressivity change progressively. This is a massive effect. So this is our way to, to, look, uh, uh, in the, to, to look at this issue of the main restore and to propose uh, this uh, type of device for this uh, neuromorphic <coughs> application. So this is the end. So there are a lot of other things to, to explain. This is a roadmap of a Japanese society that shows many other directions for spintronic, spintronic expanding in many directions. That, of course, I will not describe. I see Leo is already standing up. Um, and uh, what I will summarize in one picture only is that uh, spintronics, of course, is a young uh, science, but is growing very well now is what I represent on this uh, uh, picture here. And uh, the last uh, transparency is simply to thank uh, my co-worker. This is uh, my co-worker in the lab, which is a joint lab of uh, CNRS, National Center of Research in France, and company Thales. And uh, also to thank my collaboration with, uh, in many countries, with colleagues in many countries, uh, and to finish to thank you for your attention. Thank you.